In Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 through 20, the Bible says, Now as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. For they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Turn with me to Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Verse 18, and Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 through 20, in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, I'd like to tag this text, Made to Make made to make. One of the things about going to church, being a member of a church, being a Christian, being a disciple, is that many of us go to church, call ourselves Christians, would even recognize the word disciple, and yet don't know what it is that we are designed to do. Been going to church for years and have never done exactly what Jesus Christ has committed us to. Jesus' instructions after the resurrection were go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I promise to be with you even until the end of the age. They were clear instructions. It was exactly what God has called every Christian to do every believer, every disciple. It is our mission. It is what God has called us to do, what he's purposed us to do, what he's designed for us. And the interesting thing about it is, is that you can go into the military. You can go into the Army, the Marines, the Air Force, the Navy. And you're going to go through basic training. And you're going to go through a 12-week process to get ready for what you're called to do for the rest of your life. There's a process of initiation, a process by which everyone in a military background knows exactly what the next man or the next sister has gone through. They know that. If you were to pledge a fraternity or a sorority, you know the process. You come out as an initial pledgee, finally cross the sands and are a duly initiated member into the organization. You know exactly the process. The interesting thing is, is that if you check a military man, he could go back and deal with the another man seeking to get into the military and walk them through the process. If you were going to fraternities and sororities and someone's come into the organization or they're interested in coming in, they can walk them through the process, how to get in. And those are organizations that are fleeting. Those are organizations that are not eternal. But yet there is an organization, an organism called the Church of the Living God. And many of us are members of it, but yet don't know how to initiate anybody into it. Don't know how to bring anybody into the organization, but yet we'll come to church and evaluate church and see whether or not we like it or not. And God is really not interested in your preferences. God is not interested in how long you think the service should go or how long you think it shouldn't go. He's not interested in any of that. He's interested in, are you prepared to make a disciple? Not whether or not you come and you make a decision on his church. God doesn't need you in his church in the first place. God doesn't need me in his church at all. God is simply saying, by grace and by mercy, I allowed you to know me. And I've got an assignment for you to do. And that assignment is that you would go and make disciples of all nations. But in order for you to make disciples, you first have to be made a disciple. Even if we we're going to talk about the Italiano mafioso world that I like and enjoy. Is if you get made into the mob, you know how to make another brother into the mob. Everybody knows what they're designed to do except the Christian. 
Everybody knows what and how to bring someone in and duly initiate them and grow them from infancy to maturity in their organization, except a Christian. Some of us have even been deceived to think that going to church faithfully is a good thing. Meaning that I come on Sunday and Wednesday. And so I know that I come on Wednesday and I can look around and see some of my neighbors sitting on my row and I know you don't come on Wednesday. And you're only a Sunday church goer at crossover. And so I'm a little bit more up to speed. I, I even go to the women's Bible study. I even go to the 33 series with the men. So I'm just a little bit more faithful than you. But yet... You can be deceived in going to church and not make a disciple and not have done what God has called you to do. You can have all the gifts and all the evaluations in your mind of what Christianity is really all about and how you think others ought to function. But the reality is, is if you're not taking individual people under your wing in the faith of Jesus Christ and bringing them in and raising them up and maturing and releasing them to where they can go and do the exact same thing that you do, Guess what? You missed it. Next Friday and Saturday, I'll be in San Marcos, Texas, celebrating with the Munu chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha, our 40-year anniversary. Just going out to hang out with the bros next Friday and Saturday. I found out Friday night we'll be taking some bros in. Some dudes will be crossing the sands. In 1976, the Munu chapter came into existence. I pledged in the fall of 1988, 12 years into the organization. Here it is, 2016. Munu is going to be 40 years old. That's why all the brothers are going back to celebrate a 40-year anniversary. And what we found out is 28 years later, after I pledged, the chapter is still in good shape. How do I know it? Because they're bearing and birthing new members into the chapter. It means that 28 years later, the fellas on the yard still know how to make some Alpha Phi Alpha disciples. But the question is, is do you know how to make a Christian disciple? Long time ago, I realized that I thought that this thing, Alpha Phi Alpha, was really, really something. I, I thought it was the greatest thing since sliced bread. And I believe that if we were going to continue to be great, what we need to do is to recruit. Some of the brothers were too cool for that. No, 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 man, man they got to come to us. I said, oh, no, no, brother. No, 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 brother, you missed it. How does Oklahoma have a good football team every year? They recruit. How did Nebraska at that time have a good football team every year? They recruit. How does uh, the North Carolina basketball team have a good team every year? They, they recruit. How did Notre Dame at that time have a good team every year? They recruit. So, brothers, we got to go out and recruit the best of the best we got to look around with our own eyes and see brothers that we realize that are already alpha men. They just haven't been initiated yet. We've got to see the character in them before they ever make it into the organization. So there was a young man by the name of Derek Scott. And I like Derek Scott. I like the way he carried himself. I like the way he uh, was mature in his ways. I liked his uh, quietness and his still personality. And I wanted Derek Scott to pledge the fraternity. Now, he was from Little Nowhere, Texas. Hadn't been exposed to the greatness of Alpha Phi Alpha. He, he didn't know that Dr. King and he didn't know that Thurgood Marshall. He didn't know that Jackie Robinson. He didn't know Jesse Owens. He, he just needed to know. And so what I did is I set him down in the computer lab. And I began to walk him through the history. I said, you want to know how black folk really got to vote? Alpha Phi Alpha had a program called the Voteless People is a Hopeless People Campaign. And we were the ones behind the civil rights movement. You want to know how black folk really got to go to the schools that they're going to? It's because we systematically, along with our lawyer, Thurgood Marshall, went across the southern states and the Midwest states, and we actually integrated and sued schools for, uh, 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 for, for being uh, segregationists against us, and we got in. So I began to walk him through all this history. And at the end of this long conversation, about two to three hours, I continued to work on him. And finally, the next semester, he pledged. Oh, I felt like I had accomplished something. And then I came down to Houston and found out that my pastor, Pastor Bill Lawson, was a member of the one and only Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Now, there are other good organizations out there, but Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, I found out my pastor was a member. But yet he didn't talk to me about Alpha Phi Alpha, who so-called called them the light of the world. He talked about Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world. And he began to walk me through the life of Jesus Christ. And I remember Sunday after Sunday being a 23-year-old young man crying with tears in my eyes as he walked us from Luke chapter 9 all the way to the cross. 
I remember God asking me a subtle question in my inner man. He said, you remember what you did with Derek? You remember how much time you took with Derek? How much time you spent with Derek trying to get Derek to be a member of Alpha Phi Alpha, something that is temporal and not eternal? It's fraternal, but it's not uh, eternal. Do you, do you understand what you did? He said, now I need you to do that for me. I need you to be as dedicated to bringing people into the faith and developing them and discipling them and leaving the state of the church in good condition. And so I want to tell you about this guy by the name of Jesus who had this first pledge class. He had a pledge class of 12 guys that he brought into the chapter and he put them online longer than we went online. He, he put them online longer than the military put them on. He put them online for three and a half years. And then he said, well, let me go on and graduate and go sit up in heaven. But y'all keep the chapter going. And you know that the chapter's in good shape because you're in church right now. And so we find ourselves in Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. And in Matthew chapter 4, verse 18, the Bible says this. And I'm blown away by it. My life has been forever changed by it. So if I cry during this message, just let me cry. He says this, now as Jesus was walking by the sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets. And he called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. Disciples of Jesus prioritize and pursue Jesus above their professions, their prophets, their possessions, and their parents in order to fulfill their mission. Listen to me very carefully. Jesus says to these men, he's walking along the way. Look at verse 18. Jesus is walking by the Sea of Galilee. He's walking in the area of their jobs, in the area where they work. He's invading their territory. And Jesus says to them, he sees with his own eyes Simon, who was called Peter and Andrew, his brother, and they're casting their net into the sea, and they were fishermen. And he said, come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Jesus Christ disciples, the Bible says, immediately they left their nets and came and followed him. Now they were fishermen. That was their profession. That's where they made their money. Now you got to understand, the Sea of Galilee is a port sea next to eight other cities. So these guys who fished, not only were some re little low fishermen, but they were fishermen that provided fish for eight cities. That meant that these boys had a real job with real money. They were the ones that were behind you getting the mahi-mahi at Papados. They were the ones behind you getting the poncha train at Papados. They were the ones, they were the ones that sold Papados the food so that Papados couldn't. They were the ones that made sure that the food was there. They had a real job, a real profession, and yet Jesus Christ had met these men before. This isn't the first time he met them. It says Simon, who was called Peter. Well, when was he called Peter? Back in John chapter 1, verse 35 through 42. Jesus Christ is walking along the way, and John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. And he says it one more time, Behold the Lamb of God. And his disciples went and followed him, and one of them was Andrew. And the Bible says Andrew brought his own brother named Peter, and he brings him to Jesus Christ, and his name was Simon. He now calls him, you'll be called Peter, Cephas. He calls him a rock now. All of a sudden, he's met this man before. In John chapter 2, verse 1 through 11, he turns water into wine, and the Bible says his disciples believed in him. And so these guys are already believers, but yet having seen the miraculous work of Jesus Christ and having believed that he was the Messiah, they believed and they went back to their ordinary, regular lives of fishing. And Jesus was not satisfied with you being saved. He wanted you to be sanctified. He was not satisfied with you being converted. He wanted you to be committed. He wasn't satisfied with you believing. He wanted you to behave like him. Jesus Christ says, no, I don't, don't miss this thing. Don't just be a Christian. Don't just be a believer. I want you to be a disciple. 
I want you to be somebody who can follow me because I called you. Now watch this. It's amazing. He says they, they, they follow him above their profession. Now, not everybody's going to leave their job because you can go into the New Testament and find out that people like uh, Aquila and Priscilla were definitely committed believers, but they were tent makers. But here's all he means is that if you prioritize Jesus as a disciple, you will act like Jesus on your job. You will not get caught up in the fray, in the periphery of the job, and all that nonsense, and the foolish jokes, and the gossiping on the job. You will represent Christ, and you can take all your crosses down and your footprint logos down to say that you're a Christian. You will live in such a way that folk will know that you're a Christian. He says, I want you to prioritize me above your job, that your meaning does not come from your workplace. The meaning comes from the one that you worship. Now, he doesn't stop there. He says, you got some Oh, you got a profession. But because you have a profession, you have profits. The Bible says that they left their nets. Now, you can have a boat, but if you don't have a net, you can't make no money. So it said they left their nets. In other words, they left what made them their money, their income, their source. And they began to say, I'm not just depending on my ability to fish. I'm now going to depend on Jehovah Jireh to provide for me in all ways. In other words, it's not working extra hours to make more money. No, that's not it. It's about working and worshiping the king of glory so that I can make more disciples. Do I have time to make disciples or do I just have time to make more money? Do I, I understand we work. I understand all that. But do we spend more time on the job than we do working for the king? Jesus Christ is demanding. He's, he's one who wants to know, what are you all about? And so he says, I want you to prefer, uh, uh, pursue me over your prophets. But then the Bible goes on and he says that these boys left their boats. The next set, check it out in the text. He saw two other brothers, James and Zebedee, uh, the John, his brother, and on the, uh, they were in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Watch, Jesus says, I want you to leave your possessions. If you're going to be my disciple, understand this. The reason why a lot of people will settle for and a lot of pastors will settle for giving you good church is because they know that if I call you to be a disciple, it costs too much. See, the reason why a lot of pastors just teach certain little kind things is because they never put a demand on you to be a disciple. But yet, the army didn't make it easy. The Marines didn't make it easy. The Navy didn't make it easy. The Air Force didn't. The fraternity, the they didn't make it easy. But yet, we come to Christianity and we want easy street. But it wasn't easy for Christ to go up the cross. We want an easy faith, but we don't want to suffer in the faith. We don't want to sacrifice. He said he left their boats and they followed him. They left their father. In other words, if your parents aren't on mission, you got to let them go. Now, I want you to walk through, walk with me over to the book of Luke. Let's fast forward over to Luke real quick because I want to show you some things. Just some conversations all had by Jesus in Luke 18. All, he's in every single one of these conversations. Luke 18, 18 through 24. He's going to first talk to somebody about leaving their prophets. There was a rich young ruler. And in Luke 18, verse 18, the Bible says, A ruler questioned him and said, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now you got to catch what just happened. The man called him teacher. He said, No, homeboy, I'm God. See, you ain't just following Jesus so you can get a little teaching. You're following the God of all creation. You're, calling, you're following the God that makes the sun come up. You're, you're calling the God that made the moon come up. You're following God that makes the birds fly and the birds. You're following God, boy. You, you better know who you're talking to. Verse 20, he tells him, oh, so, so, so since you call me teacher, you know something. Let's do, do, do a little Bible quiz. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. Now he gave him five of, of, of the ten uh, commandments. Now the second six commandments are about your fellow man and your relationship with him. The first four are about your relationship with God. So what Jesus did is he mixed up the, the, these commandments and put them out of order. And so he left one out intentionally. Now watch this. And he said, all things I have kept. He said, the, the, the man said, all these things I've kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said, one thing you still lack. Sell all that you possess and distribute it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. 
And when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. And Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter into the kingdom of God. Watch this, y'all. The man had his money, and he had a chance to follow the master. He had a chance to follow the one who has created all things, the one who owns a cattle on a thousand hills. He had a chance to follow him, but yet because of his money, he stopped and wouldn't follow Jesus. He missed Jesus over a paycheck. Not knowing that Jesus was going to pay a check that he could never... He, he, he missed Jesus over a paycheck. It's sad out there that you got a chance to follow him, but a, but a paycheck keeps you from avoiding Jesus. Jesus tells him, hey man, how easy it is, how hard it is for a rich man to make it into the kingdom of heaven because of his wealth. Money got in the way between you and Jesus. Money that temporally sustains you but can't eternally keep you. Money. Watch this last thing. Y'all, let, let, let me share with you real quick what he left out. The one he left out was thou shalt not covet your neighbor's stuff. You know what he did? He applied your perspective on money. See, if I give my good, hard-earned wealth away to poor folks, poor folks will have my stuff. So I'm not only coveting my stuff, I'm also coveting if somebody else has my stuff. So he said, oh, it's just one thing you like. Let's get down to the heart of the matter. You like your profession that makes your money over me. Next thing, go to Luke chapter 12, verse 13. These are some interesting conversations. Jesus is involved in every single one of them. Luke 12, verse 13 through 15. What does it mean to prioritize him over your possessions? Luke 12, verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, there it is. He's just a little teacher. Tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said, man, who appointed me a judge or arbitrator over you? Now, before I go any further, I want you to understand something. The man just hollered out after Bible study, teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. L let me get my money. Do you know what Jesus had just taught? If you go back to Luke 12, verse 4 and 5, he said, do not fear the one who can kill the body, and after that has no more he can do. Don't fear the crypts. Don't fear the bloods. But fear the one who can kill the body and has authority to toss you in hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Then he comes back and says, uh, if you deny me on earth, I'll deny you in front of the angels in heaven. Now, with that type of solid, deep teaching, you would think that somebody would ask a question about that. But that boy wasn't thinking about that. In the midst of this solid teaching, he's thinking about his money. Watch this thing now. And so Jesus says, man, who appointed me a judge or arbitrator over you? Then he said to him, beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. Your life is not made up of stuff. Y'all, in our bedroom, Renique and I have a flat screen TV. It's about from 2002. It weighs about 800 pounds. It's not the thin one like you got today. It's, it's not, you go buy it, it's, you know, heat is coming off of it. I don't need a new flat one just because that one works. I can see everybody. I don't need a new phone just because it came out so I can keep up with the latest and greatest. Our life is more made up and caught up on possessions that we'll miss the Savior. Watch this. I got to give you one more. Luke 14, verse 25 to 27. How serious is Jesus about you being a disciple? What Jesus is demanding is that you prioritize him and you pursue him over everything. And the question is, is he worth it? That's the question. Luke 14, verse 25. Now large crowds were going along with him. And he turned to see them. It was a big old crowd. Easter Sunday worship service. He says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father, mother, wife, and children, and brothers and sisters, yet even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Jesus says the relationships that you think you value the most, when it comes down to loving me or loving them, it ought to look like hate. 
He's not saying, I want you to physically hate your parents. But if someone were saying, there's a decision that needs to be made for Christ or a decision that needs to be made in the tradition of your family, you better make it for Christ. He said, every single time, if you're going to be a disciple, you make a decision for Jesus every single time. If your mom and dad say, no, do this, do that. No, Jesus said. He said, this is discipleship. He's he not talking about being a Christian. He, he, he said, no, I want you to come and follow me. Now watch this. Here's the invitation. He says, and I will make you fishers of men. I, I, I want you to recognize that what I'm designing for you to do is I'm designing for you to have an encounter with me to where you follow me for the rest of your life, that you are so consumed with me and by me and what I've done for you, that for the rest of your life you follow me. But not only do you benefit from it, but you want somebody else to benefit from the blessing. The reason why I'm praying for you, the reason why I'm inviting you to church, brother, is because you don't know what it looks like to live with Jesus. Is there anybody in here that recognizes my life is just a tad bit better with Jesus than it was without him? Now, if you know that you've experienced the blessing, why aren't we telling somebody about this Jesus? You got family members that call you with problems that don't know how to pray. And yet you've called on him in the midnight hour and he's answered. Guess what? They'll quit calling you if you tell them to call him. You don't have to be worried with all their problems and talk, having a wasted conversation. Why? Because you taught them how to dial in. Disciple teaches folk how to dial in and get close. And here's the deal. I want you to look at it. Disciples of Jesus, not Christians, prioritize and pursue Jesus above their profession, prophets, possessions, parents in order to fulfill their purpose. Here is your purpose. Military man, military woman, fraternity brother, sorority sister. Here's your purpose, Christian, disciple of Jesus. I want you to go and be fishers of men. I want you to pursue passionately people who don't know me. Now watch this. What these fishermen right here used to do is that they would get their little hooks and get their little bait and all that. they toss it out, get their little net together, and they would take a live fish and catch them and make them die. What you and I do is we catch dead men and catch them and make them live. That's what we do. In other words, I got a whole new profession of a greater grave than you've ever experienced in all your life. You can see dead family members live again in Christ. Or you can settle for going to church and come here, pastor. But let me flip the script on this thing. Go back with me to Matthew 4, verse 18 through 20. Here's why tears are in my eyes over this thing. I just want to flip it a little bit. Because at first it looked like it was about the disciples. But really, it's about Jesus. Check it out. Jesus prioritized, pursues, picks, and produces people to fulfill his purpose. Watch. Now, as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw. Watch this. Go down to verse 20. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. And coming from there, he saw. Do you see that? Jesus Christ is saying, I'm not satisfied with y'all just being saved. And Jesus Christ prioritizes your life to the degree that he pursues you. He pursues you in your place. Y'all, let me go on and testify. My name is Blake Wilson. Who am I named after? I'm named after a white pastor of the University Baptist Church in Austin, Texas during the Civil Rights Movement. His name was Pastor Blake Smith. Pastor Blake Smith came uh, by, by watching TV in the Civil Rights Movement. He was at the University of Conservative Texas at that time where they, were, they, they weren't fooling with black folk unless you played on the football team. Watch this now. And so all of a sudden, uh, this pastor was watching the civil rights movement and watching what was going on and watched the death and the murder of Dr. King. And he said, I can't do this anymore. I, I can't preach to all white folk no more. And he comes to University Baptist Church, all the intellectuals, all the conservatives of the day who were conservative, he said, I can't preach to just white folk no more. We can't do this. And he began to talk about the Great Commission and going to all nations. He said, if you know someone African-American or any other race, invite them to church. My mom happened to be working in the English department at the University of Texas, and one of his members worked there alongside of her, invited my mom to church. My mom started going to the University Baptist Church and just visiting and heard Pastor Blake Smith. And when my mom was pregnant with me, my brother's name was Brian Eric Wilson, and she was lying on the in, in the delivery room, and she was praying as they were preparing her for, and, and Dr. Blake Smith walks in. 
And Pastor Smith comes in and he says, I just came to pray with you, Georgine, before you had this little baby boy. And my mama said, he'll be named Blake. God was pursuing me while I was in the womb. We go to Greater Mount Zion Baptist Church, and there are these families, the Andersons, the Brooks, the Cradens, and the Wilson, that they all have been in the church like 800 million years. And, and so they put us in the, the so-called hall of faith in our church. And so they had all these people, a big ceremony representing our families, and they said they had doctors speaking on behalf of their family, lawyers and dentists speaking. And they said all the other families had doctors, lawyers, and dentists, and the family chooses Blake to speak. I'm in the seventh grade. What am I going to say? They got doctors, lawyers, and dentists, and they pick, the family picks me to speak. I didn't volunteer, and all I know is that right before I got up to speak, I read Matthew 10, 16 through 20, and God spoke to me, and I had a word, and all I know is that God was pursuing me. That's, that's all I know. I went off to college, and when I get to college, I'm trying to go to a party just like everybody else. They called it a social. I, I was trying to go to one of those, and Sherry Humphrey says, come talk to me, and give me Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4 through 19. says, read this. God has this for you. I don't know what's happening. God was pursuing me. I go from there and I meet Earl Mosley and Earl Mosley begins to talk to me about Jesus. All I know is that God was pursuing me. And if you look back over your life, doesn't that blow your mind that God pursued you? That God came after you? He thought about you? He walks by the sea to meet you? To see you right there? Come on out of that boat. I'm calling you. I end up pledging this organization called Alpha Phi Alpha. Chris Bilton invites Pastor Bill Lawson to come and speak at our banquet, same one we're going to next week. I meet Pastor Lawson, moved to Houston, thought I moved to Houston, but got my steps ordered to Houston by God. Go to Pastor Lawson's church, hear about this Jesus, and God was pursuing me. Pastor Lawson says, Blake, go to Dallas Theological Seminary or Southern Seminary in Kentucky, and God was pursuing me the whole time. I, I, I didn't know, but doesn't it blow your mind? If I, I'm giving you my testimony, but think about your own. That God came after you and said, I don't want you just to be saved. I want you to pursue me. Now watch this. He picked us. Mark 3, verse 13 through 14. Flip over one more time. I'm not going to bother you with this too much. But watch this. I want you to see it. Mark 3, verse 13. You ought to be blown away when you read this. Jesus Christ is looking for some people to follow him closely. In verse 13, it says, and he went up on the mountain basically to pray and summoned those whom he himself wanted, and they came to him. Now, underline, he summoned those who he himself wanted. Did you catch it? You may not be wanted by your family members. You may not be wanted by your friend, the boy that you thought you were after. But Jesus Christ wanted you and summoned you and said, come to me. And he appointed 12 that they would be with him, spend time with him, that he could send them out to preach. He didn't send them, he, I don't want you just to come hang out with me. I want you to come hang out with me, get to know me, and then I'm going to send you out and preach once you know my character. Once you know how I handle things. It ought to blow you away that out of all of creation that you did not end up in church on accident. You ended up in church because before the foundation of the world, Jesus Christ wrote your name down in the Lamb's Book of Life. You ought to be blown away that your mama couldn't name you anything else but what you named you because he wrote your name down because he was pursuing you. He picked you. He picked you. He said, all I want you to do is go and make disciples of all nations. I want to make you fishers of men. Now watch this. He produces something out of us. In other words, he doesn't just get us in the family and let us be in the family. No, no, no. I will make you. In other words, I'm, I'm going to give you a promise. And here's my promise. I'm going to make you fishers of men. I'm going to build you into men and women who fish after other people who are dead and make them live in Christ. Why? Because you recognize how good it is to be, how good it is to be caught by God. You recognize how good it is to be caught by God, to be blown away that God would call you. We have family members this morning that aren't thinking about church. We have family members that are in the nation of Islam, all that kind of nonsense, don't know anything about a Jesus. The other day, my wife and I were watching our little show, NCIS Los Angeles. We were watching it, and it was about these, we had missed a couple of shows because of our schedule. So we went back to watch it, and they had these boys, these young boys, 
that were going to blow themselves up. And as I watched the show, I watched the radical mentality of boys that said, he, he asked LL Cool J, do you believe in Allah? And LL said, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm like him, you know, and all that kind of jazz. And he said, well, then prepare to meet him. Yo, I was like, God, dog. This boy here is serious about his Allah. In other words, I got to die to go meet Allah, to do something to prove by Allah. But Jesus Christ died so that you don't have to do anything to be approved by him. You missed it. Y'all, I got to go, so let's flip on over to Matthew 28. After all this time that they spend with Jesus, from Matthew 4 to Matthew 28, Jesus tells them this one key thing. I'm going to die, I'm going to be buried, and I'm going to be raised on the third day. Now, when I get up, I'm going to tell you a message. I got all power in my hand. Now, notice this. That as you flip to Matthew 28, you got to think about one more thing. That Jesus Christ was not just talking about these 12 disciples. Because in Matthew 16, 24, he said, If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and pick up his cross and follow me daily. In other words, disciples of Jesus publicly pursue the passion of Jesus above their own personal passions. He said, pick up your cross, deny yourself. Deny yourself of all the things that you want in life and pursue what I want for you in life. And you watch what I'll do for you if you'll be my disciple. He said, in other words, disciples of Jesus Christ pick up their crosses daily and follow them. Notice, their minds are preoccupied with Christ. They're not Sunday Christians and Wednesday. They're not, they are every single day I am consumed and blown away by the reality that Jesus Christ died for me. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I'm going to tell y'all the truth as your pastor. Every now and then I'm sitting in my room and I'm saying, am I really saved? I mean, I'm really going to go be with him? I don't know about y'all. You, you, I'm blown away that he knows me and would choose me and use me. Why would you do that with me? Watch this. So he says, here's the real deal. If you're going to be my disciple, it's going to cost you something. Now, in other words, when we, when we pledged the fraternity, there was one thing that you did not want your line to be accused of. Skating. Some of y'all don't know that thing. But one thing, you, you didn't want to moonwalk into the, into the frat. You wanted to be pledged. I, I got a good friend in the congregation. They had a girl, and they called her the Chronicle. That means that's paper, Sora. She, she, she ain't go through the process. She, she, she wasn't pledged properly. Jesus Christ says, people that are identified as my disciples, you got to go through something. You got to pick up your cross and follow me daily and deny yourself. Why? It, it, it simply means this, Blake, when the man told you that in 10 years you'll be a millionaire with the stock options that Minute made, and you go and leave that for $625 a week, Blake, I need you to deny yourself. I need you to deny yourself of what you're pursuing. Why? Because if you keep talking about orange juice and wa Eggo waffles, that's all you'll be doing. But I need you to raise up and talk about Jesus the Christ. And so in Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20, Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. And he has these instructions. And here it is. This is, this is all of Christianity right here. Verse 18. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I command you. And lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Notice this. Jesus passes his power, his program, his plans, his disciples, with the promise of his presence to fulfill his purpose. Here it is in Matthew 28. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. It simply means that Jesus Christ has all power. He has all power in heaven and all power on earth. And he's going to allow you and I to access all power in heaven and in all power on earth. It simply means this. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Notice, I got power in both realms, the unseen realm and the seen realm. Now watch this. So here's the deal. Whatever problems that you're facing with people in your family on earth, recognize that I got the answer in heaven. And when you access the power of God from heaven through prayer and belief, then you bring down the power of God from heaven and you apply it on earth situations. And that family member that does not know Jesus is all of a sudden impacted by the power of God. What did he say in Acts 1? But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. In other words, that when the God of God comes by and the person of the Holy Spirit to impact the people, you will be my witnesses. And when you utilize the power of the Holy Spirit, you will impact people's lives and change their lives forever. I've got all power and authority in heaven and on earth. But you and I think that we got this weak Christianity. And God is saying, you got a jacked up family member? Put some of this authority and power on him. You got a lost family member? You want to see how dig all, how, how, how strong my muscles are? Oh, you got a gay family member? Oh, you got a lesbian family member? Oh, you got a family member that's a, that's a Muslim? Oh, you think that all power can't fix gay, lesbian, and Muslim? I have all power in heaven and on earth, and I'm giving it to you. And some of us are walking around as if we have no power, afraid of folk. He says this, watch this. Go therefore and baptize and make disciples. Baptize all nations, making disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, recently I've had some ministry opportunities. And he says, go and make disciples of all nations. When I spent time at the College of Biblical Studies for nine years as a professor there, I had a chance to interact with white, Hispanic, Asian, black, Indian, all that. Recently I was invited to do a camp called the Man Camp by Jared Manning, one of the white brothers that God allowed me to disciple. And here it is, is that Jared has gone off to Boyce and got his degree from Boyce and now is at Southern Seminary where Pastor Lawson told me the other seminary to go to. And he's now assistant pastor at this church down in Brazosport, Texas, discipling all these men. And all of a sudden we're at a camp with 120 men and the pastor comes up to me and says, Blake, I know that you discipled uh, Jared back in the day, but let me tell you something. He's not only a great musician, he said, but this boy is a solid teacher of the word of God. Now, when he says go and make disciples of all nations, he's not just saying you got to go to Africa. He's not just saying you got to go to Europe. He said there's some white folk, there's some Asian folk, there's some Indian folk. And, and, and don't take Christianity and make it an all black thing, all white thing, all Indian, all Hispanic. You make sure you make disciples of all nations. And now Blake, a black man, is reaching white folk because I disciple Jared. In other words, I have designed you to have influence throughout all the world based on the fact you made disciples. So when you make disciples and people believe in Jesus Christ and you raise them up and then they're making disciples, you are having impact in places that you're not. Do you realize that Jesus Christ is having impact right now in places that he's not? He's seated right next to the Father in heaven, but he's having impact right now through people on earth that have been made disciples. He's saying the same thing that I do, I want you to do. Do you just have friends that you interact with and yet they go places but they don't tell anybody about Jesus? Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now watch this. He says, I want you to baptize them. In other words, once they get converted, I want you to put them down in the water so they can identify with the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus. But notice what he says. He says, baptize them in the name of the Father. Baptize them in the name of the Son. And baptize them in the name of the Holy Ghost. In other words, baptize them with them knowing that God the Father chose them before the foundation of the world. Baptize them knowing that Jesus Christ came and redeemed them while he was living on earth. And baptize them knowing that the Holy Spirit has sealed them and is filling them for the rest of their lives and keeping them for all eternity. Baptize them with them knowing something. See, see, see if you just hear about the Trinity but don't know what the Trinity's done for you, you won't understand. God the Father chose you before the world began. God the Son came into earth and died for you while he was here. And the Holy Ghost came and sealed you and lives inside of you right now. So you have God living inside of you. So how can you not be prepared for what you got to do? How can you not be prepared for what I've called you to do? Except you've never been called to go and make disciples. Pastors were so easy on you. Churches were so easy on you. Why? Because we want money in the trade. So we won't call you to do what God has called you to do. We won't tell you here's your responsibility. And then I want you to see something. If you think that the assignment is too grand, 
Check it out. He says, teach them to observe all that I commanded you. In other words, you have to know something first. Teach them all that I commanded you, disciples. I've been walking with y'all. I've been pledging y'all for three and a half years. I want you to teach them all that I commanded you. you got to be able to pass the history down to the chapter. Y'all, this weekend, I know I'm going down to the yard, so i got to freshen up on my material. I don't want us to be singing the Alpha hymn and I done forgot that thing. I don't want to go house the Alpha, I done forgot that thing. I, I don't want to go if and, and I done forgot. No, I, I, I better know my stuff when I go down there. He said, I want you to teach them everything I commanded you. You better know something as a Christian. God is not pleased with ignorant Christians. Because ignorant Christians cannot teach what he has taught them to the next generation. And when you don't teach people what, what is taught to them, uh, y'all, y'all, let me share this with me. A pastor, a young man that I'm discipling right now, he hit me up last night. He said, Pastor, he said, you know, I'm trying to minister to this new generation. He said, he said pray for me. I'm putting up my iPad and preaching to the folk, and I'm just breaking out my Bible. Starting the day, I'm just going to break out my Bible, and we're going to walk through that book. You, you, know, you, know, you know, this new generation, they got the cute iPad, phone, Bible, and all that kind of jazz. Y'all ain't nobody impressed with that. You better get out some scripture, some, some book. And he said, man, I, I've been doing all this cute stuff with the new generation. He said, Pastor, I'm just going to get the book out. I've been taught some stuff, and I'm not going to hide what I've been taught. Teach them to observe all that he's commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Watch this now. He promised them his presence. Y'all... This is a massive assignment for 11 men to go and make disciples of all nations. But he said, you know how you're going to do it? Lo, I am with you always. I'm going to say it one more time. You'll catch it. Lo, I am with you always. One more time. You'll get it. Lo, I am with you always. You didn't catch it, so I'll help you. In Exodus chapter 3, there was a man by the name of Moses who said, God, you're calling me to do something great and grand. Who am I going to tell him sent me? He said, I'm going to tell you who sent you. I am that I am. In other words, you got the same God that got Moses through the wilderness to lead the children of Israel. And the same God is telling you, J. Mike, I'm with you. Reggie, I'm with you. John, I'm with you. I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. What else do you need? You have the promise of God's presence everywhere you go. I'm with you. Don't you ever walk up to somebody nervous about talking to them to Jesus. Moses walked up in Pharaoh's presence and said, Pharaoh, let me tell you something, homeboy. The God of God said, let my people go that they may come and worship me. Took him through ten plagues. And Moses had the presence. I want to know who's sending me. I am that I am is sending you. And the same I am that's sending them is the same I am that's sending you. He's sending you to go and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. And the Bible says, and Jesus was going. The Bible said in Matthew 4, he was going. In other words, while you are in process to doing what you do on a day-to-day basis, open up your eyes for discipleship. It literally means that as you are going and walking throughout your day, on your job, in your neighborhood, go and make disciples. Impact people for Jesus every single place you go. You might be planting, you might be watering, you might be building, but you had to do something. Do something. Why? Because God has called you to go and make disciples. You can come to church your entire life, but if you can never have a disciple to your credit, when you stand before God in heaven, wouldn't it be a shame? Wouldn't it be a shame for you to get to heaven and God say, see, 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 y'all, here's one thing I believe. I believe that when you and I get to heaven based on this great commission, God's going to look at you and he's going to look around you. I believe he's going to look at you, and I believe he's going to look around you. And he's going to want to find out who else is in the chapter because you got initiated. Who else is in the family of God because you got born again? I believe he's going to look. And y'all, 
I pray for all of us in the room, starting today, that there would never, ever be a day where God says, I don't see nobody behind you. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I command you. And lo, I promise I will be with you even until the end of the age. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.